Maybe have your attention, please. The session is about to begin. Please take your seat. Please note, additional seating is available in plenaries east and west on level four of the Hilton. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, who is president of COP28, which will take place in the United Arab Emirates uh, next autumn. <laughs> Dr. Sultan, you can see people are glad you're here, so thank you for coming. Uh, doctor, I met uh, Dr. Sultan, of course, is uh, CEO of uh, ADNOC, but he's also the chairman and founder of Mazdar, which is the uh, Abu Dhabi uh, renewable energy company. And we met in 2007 when I uh, was standing in the corner of a conference room in Dubai, and he had this very, uh, what seemed to be an unusual mission at the time. He'd been charged with setting up a renewable energy entity uh, in an oil producing country, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, and he was figuring out how to do it and what its mission would be. It became Mazdar, which is, I believe, the second largest producer of renewable uh, electricity uh, from wind and solar in the world. And so, uh, and he continues in that role as well. So, um, Dr. Sultan, we're very pleased that you're here to talk about COP28 and what you want to achieve. And I turn the platform over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Dan, for that very kind introduction. And it is indeed good that I see so many friends colleagues, and familiar faces at this year's Sierra Week. Sierra Week continues to bring together the industry professionals and thought leaders who help shape the global energy agenda. And I can comfortably say that in this room, there is a very evident representation of an industry that has delivered incredible global progress, lifted people out of poverty, and strengthened nations and economies. Before I begin, let me be candid. As COP president designate, I had some mixed feelings about coming here today. I consulted with many trusted colleagues and friends and thought long and hard before deciding that I had to be here. I decided to come because I believe that the challenges we have to address 
must include all parties working together on fast-tracking solutions, solutions that the world urgently needs. And I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to meet with those who can make the biggest difference in addressing the challenges we face. And I know that some of you have felt excluded from the climate dialogue in the past, while others may have felt that this is not their problem to fix. I also know that the energy leaders in this room have the knowledge, the experience, the expertise, and the resources needed to address the dual challenge of driving sustainable progress while holding back emissions. And I truly believe in our collective ability to step up and make a difference because otherwise we will just keep going in circles. Today, I want us all to start a new chapter. And I know that I don't have all the answers. In fact, none of us do. But here is what I do know. We need everyone to be engaged. Only if we're serious about making the transformational progress that the world needs today. For our part in the United Arab Emirates, we have chosen to face global challenges head on by adopting positive mindset and working with like-minded partners from all over the world. And the truth is, we have been on this path for more than two decades. We have always balanced between economic growth with environmental responsibility and put climate action at the heart of our development agenda. We were the first country in our region to commit to the Paris Agreement, the first to set out a pathway to net zero, and we have diversified our energy mix into solar, nuclear, and hydrogen. We have also introduced demand-side management and energy efficiency across the board. Put simply, we are not shying away from the energy transition. In fact, we are running towards it. We are embracing the transition simply because we see an enormous economic opportunity and we know it will make the world better, healthier, safer, and of course, more secure. Over the last several years, I have been a frequent participant here at Sierra Week and have always valued the contributions of such gathering to the global energy agenda. At the top of that agenda sits the energy trilemma. How to supply affordable energy to a growing world while protecting our planet from the global climate crisis? Let me tell you how I see the problem we are solving for, based on the science and the facts. The latest IPCC report tells us that temperatures continue to rise 0.2 degrees per decade. We are already seeing the impacts from rising sea levels to failed harvests to food and water insecurity. Everyone is affected. And we know that the most vulnerable communities across the global south are the most affected. These are the facts. These are based on the science. And here is the math. Last year, the global population passed 8 billion. And by the, by the year 2030, there will be an additional half a billion people on our planet demanding more energy every year. And at the same time, and according to the IPCC, the world needs to cut emissions by 7% each year to keep 1.5 alive. That's 43% in less than seven years. 
This year, the world will evaluate exactly where we are when it comes to climate progress. And that is going to happen through the first global stock take. But we already know that we are way off track. We, in fact, don't need to wait for the global stock take to, stock take to, take, to happen. We already know we are way off track. And what we need is a major course correction. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, we must accept the fact that this is a global challenge that calls for global solutions from every stakeholder acting in unity and solidarity. And as the UAE prepares to host COP28, we approach this task with humility, a clear sense of responsibility, and a great sense of urgency. We need action, and we need to act together, and we need to act now. Every government, every industry, every business, and every individual has a role to play. No one can be on the sidelines. And this industry in particular is integral to developing the solutions. In fact, this industry must take responsibility and lead the way. And to echo two famous phrases of this great city, First, we need to recognize, Houston, we have a problem. And then, and then we need to agree that failure is just not an option. Alongside, alongside all industries, the oil and gas sector needs to up its game, do more, and do it faster, and be more efficient in doing so. It needs to rapidly decarbonize its own operations, and it has a, a vital role to play in decarbonizing its customers and consumers and those who use the hydrocarbons they produce. The science is just clear. It's crystal clear. We need to get fully behind net zero. Only half of the industry has declared scope one and two, net zero goal by, 2030, by 2050. Everyone in the industry needs to be aligned around the same goal. And we should stretch ourselves to go, to go further. And let's aim to achieve net zero even earlier. Why wait to 2050? I am sure this can be done much earlier. Let's scale up best practices and aim to reach net zero methane emissions by 2030. <laughs> we must electrify operations, equip facilities with carbon capture and storage, and use all available technologies to increase efficiency across the board. And let's monitor, measure, and validate progress every step of the way. Distinguished delegates, making a dent in the climate crisis is not just about decarbonizing oil and gas operations. With the right incentives, the right technologies, the right mindset, and the right partnership model, the oil and gas industry has the capacity and has the resources to help everyone address scope three. Keep in mind that power generation is the sector where the biggest impact can be made in the shortest amount of time. By 2030, renewable energy capacity needs to triple. This is the decade to diversify portfolios. This is the decade to future-proof companies. 
and this is the decade to provide the clean energy the world needs. That said, we know that for high emitting sectors, renewable energy is just not going to be enough. Aluminum, steel, and cement, and many other heavy industries make up 30% of global emissions. These are the essential industries that make the world work. And our job is to help make them work better and make them work cleaner. Now is the time to commercialize carbon capture and take it to scale across all industries. And let's develop and commercialize and expand hydrogen production by 2030. And as a nascent technology, entrepreneurship, innovation, and collaboration will be key to building out the entire hydrogen value chain. And we, in the United Arab Emirates, are very ready to partner with all those who want to join us to translate this vision into reality. Those who are interested in making it happen, please approach us. I extend an open invitation for those who want to translate this hydrogen dream into reality. And we do this while keeping in mind that energy efficiency must sit across everything we do. It is easy, it is fast, and it's cheap. We can't think about big ideas without first going after the low-hanging fruits. And energy efficiency, as far as I'm concerned, is a quick win, and we must stay laser-focused on it. Let's work with customers to improve energy efficiency while increasing access to zero-carbon energies. And let's stay laser-focused on our objectives of rolling back emissions, not progress. Ladies and gentlemen, decarbonizing economies at scale requires an enabling ecosystem. An ecosystem that connects policy, people, technology, and capital. Policymakers must create the incentives that move the market in the right direction. Industry needs clear policies to guide long-term investment decisions. And a good example of that is the recent Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States that is stimulating low-carbon, high-growth investment opportunities. Such regulations will accelerate breakthrough technologies to unlock battery storage, bring down the cost of carbon capture, and develop and commercialize the hydrogen value chain. And people need to work together. People need to be empowered. They need to break out of their silos and unify around a common cause. Of course, none of this progress will happen without capital. Lots of capital. The, enti the entire financial community needs to play a much bigger role. And according to the IEA, the world invested 1.4 trillion US dollars in the energy transition in 2022. We need over three times that amount. Capital must come from all sources, governments, the private sector, institutional investors, private equity, industry, and international financial institutions. And when it comes to financing the energy transition, we must ensure that no one is left behind. Only 15% of clean tech investments reached developing economies in the global south. And that is where 80% of the population live. That is why we need to fundamentally reform the IFIs and the MDBs to unlock concessional finance, lower risk, and attract greater private investment. 
I hope that we can make real traction on this front at the upcoming IMF World Bank Spring meetings next month. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, transforming the world's energy systems represents the greatest opportunity for human and economic development since the first industrial revolution. It is this industry's opportunity to reinvent itself and lead again. Let me call on you to decarbonize quicker, future-proof sooner, and create the energy system of the future today. And let me extend an open invitation to all parties across government, the private sector, and civil society. Cooperate, collaborate, share your ideas, and talk to us. And let's remember that progress is made through partnership, not polarization. Let's unite a divided world with a cup of solidarity, a cup of action, and a cup for all. All of us need to be pulling in the same direction because there is more energy and unity than division. I will consult and I will convene with all stakeholders. I am here to listen and I am here to engage. There is a lot of work to do and no time to spare. Let's match our commitment to our capacity. We must have the will. We certainly have what it takes to make the difference. This is our moonshot. And failure is not an option. Thank you. Dr. Sultan, thank you for that very uh, strong and inspiring speech. You certainly, uh, in it, laid out an agenda for the industry. Let me turn to your agenda. Cop, to put on a COP is a very complicated thing. Uh, what is your agenda for the COP? What, what will be, and what will be the measure of success? Again, the success will be measured by all uh, parties, the 198 parties to the convention. And as you are well aware, my job is to build consensus and to lay out uh, a roadmap, as well as create space and the situation for such dialogue to take shape. I will also work on building bridges between North and South, private sector, governments, and all stakeholders. I will ensure that we clearly adopt an agenda that is centered around execution and implementation. I will bring what we do best in the UAE, and that is delivery, delivery, delivery. Results, uh, our objective is, our agenda is going to be very much centered around being results driven and action oriented. So in a nutshell, what I can comfortably tell you because of the overwhelming support we have received from like-minded partners, those who are genuinely keen and interested in helping address, address this challenge and develop a pragmatic, practical approach, those who are ready to balance, a stri strike a balance between passion and realism, I am very confident that we'll be able to deliver a transformational progress coming out of COP28. You have long experience, of course, you've been the UAE's climate negotiator for many years, but as you know better than anybody, there's been some criticism in some quarters of your selection as president of COP. What, uh, what should your critics know about your taking on this role? I appreciate that, but uh, I do invite them to look at my, uh, my career history. I mean, uh, I started uh, as an engineer who was given uh, a mandate to help the diversification of our economy by adopting uh, an energy mix approach 
and that's where I was given the opportunity to establish and launch uh, Masdar, who have become the second largest renewable energy in the world. We today own 25,000 megawatts of green operational, green electrons on our balance sheet. We're growing it to 100 gigawatts by 2030. We are in 40 countries. Uh, and I am very proud uh, of that uh, development. Having said that, even when it comes to my role in ADNOC, I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve in ADNOC. My job was simply centered around three objectives, and that was transform, decarbonize, and future-proof ADNOC. We have been able to transform uh, ADNOC. It has become the most advanced and the most progressive global energy company. We have adopted best-in-class technologies. We have uh, integrated low-carbon solutions across the board. We've electrified all of our operations. All of our operations is fully powered by zero carbon emissions. And we have uh, also deployed carbon capture and storage. And we're already prog progressively pursuing uh, hydrogen. ADNOC today invests in the renewable energy space. So just being the CEO of ADNOC without knowing what we have been able to achieve in a very, uh, very short period of time in terms of transforming and decarbonizing and future-proof ADNOC, I don't think is the right way of looking at things. We should look at the whole uh, track record, experience, and what I can comfortably say is that I'll bring a sober, action-oriented, results-driven uh, agenda to help advance uh, the global climate uh, dialogue. Yeah. Well, we recognize COP28. Uh, your focus really will be not on words, but on results, and you bring that long experience to it. Uh, it's really important that you came here as COP, president of COP28 to address uh, this audience here. Uh, we're in two floors, actually, that you're talking to. Uh, it's very meaningful, and uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you, and we wish you all the best on uh, actualizing uh, the agenda that's ahead over the next six months. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for joining us. The plenary